Well, a good morning to you. As always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. You're right on time for today's edition of Morning Express. My name is Jesse Rogers, and we're coming to you live from the Standard Group headquarters right here. Good morning once again, and you're watching Morning Express. As always, we get to kickstart your day in style, taking a look at what you can expect in today's dailies. As you've just seen, that's the front page of the Standard, and we'll be getting into the thick of it later on during the broadcast as we review the latest news making headlines, not just on Kenya's bold newspaper, The Standard. I equally have with me The Daily Nation, and it has a lot to do with the current situation in the country, not just politically, economically as well, and matters touching on education. So much to do, so little time. So let's get started. Before we take a look at what has been covered in the local dailies, let's take a look at what's transpiring internationally. And we begin closer home uh, with Uganda, where the Daily Monitor covers extensively some of the main stories coming from this neighboring country, include what Uganda can learn from Madagascar oil crisis, where according to the article, some experts are calling for a revival of Gaddafi's dream of an African Union as a perfect safeguard against oligarchs and powerful multinational corporations. Interesting article there, touching on Africa's vast resources. Even as they touch briefly on massacre murders, locals are fleeing homes, even as authorities are encouraging residents who stay alone to be accommodated by others in the same locality to reduce their vulnerability to attacks. Machete-wielding thugs strike Busia. Unfortunate news right here, where local council authorities say security has deteriorated and attacks against innocent residents are rising. I think this is closer to the border between Kenya and Uganda. We'll definitely continue monitoring the state of security right there. Government prioritizes vehicles for VIPs over health services. Unfortunate quite here, as data shows that whereas the government has an appetite to purchase vehicles for its most paid civil servants and politicians, it seems to be less keen in purchasing vehicles for various health services across the country. More details on that particular article. Let's cross over to the citizen. The latest from Tanzania include 20 suspects escaping after fooling police officers. At least 20 suspects right there escaped in Bagala, Dar es Salaam on Saturday evening after overpowering a police officer. More details on that particular jailbreak. It seems with that, uh, what's it called? I was about to refer to the latest series that is actually centered on jailbreaks and all that. It seems it's motivating individuals, unfortunately, right there. But anyway, Registrar wades into impasse between political parties and police over workshops. More details on that particular issue. But in terms of politics, the judge in Bowie's terrorism financing case has just stepped down where Judge Elinaza has stepped down due to various issues. Perhaps more details on that particular article. Let's cross over to Rwanda today. More details on the latest from this particular country. Six Palestinians escaped from Israeli jail. More details right there. Even as Kagame says, Africa needs to produce vaccines. It seems most African leaders have the same sentiments on this in terms of importing vaccines and the priority of Africa countries in this particular list. Rwanda is expecting slightly below normal rainfall, even as teachers opt to plow back profits and cement SACO stability. That's the latest from Rwanda. Let's take a look at what's transpiring on CNN. And there we go, some of the latest news making headlines internationally. The fall of a kingpin, rise of an empire. Interesting developments right there on the meth trade in the Asian continent. Taliban accused of murdering pregnant Afghan police woman. Unfortunate news right here, even as Taliban is struggling to take control of the vast Afghanistan country. Michael K. Williams, wire actor, found dead. Unfortunate news right there from the entertainment industry, even as they cover extensively various developments, not just in the Middle East, in Africa and the continent at large. Just make sure you're adequately informed, even as we've just highlighted some of the key stories that have been covered in that particular page. Okay, let's speak about local issues right now. As I mentioned earlier, we have with us Kenya's Bull newspaper, The Standard, 
And as you saw earlier on on the front page, it's all to do with the Jubilee Party Secretary General's comments just yesterday as he was addressing members of the press. Tuju puts Ruto on KRA's radar. It's all to do with the wealth amongst these leaders where the Jubilee Party actually challenged the deputy president to publicly declare his taxes following his admission that he owns 70% of the properties listed by the Interior Cabinet Secretary, Dr. Fred Matiangi, as well as 200,000 chickens, giving him an income of 1.5 million shillings every day through the sale of eggs. It was sort of a challenge lead by example, according to Tuju, since you actually came out rightly to mention 70% is what you own. Why not back this ownership with payments made to KRA, the tax body. And he's quoted right there saying, mate, please Ruto to show young people the skills to acquire such property in such a short time. He should also teach us the clueless adults, perhaps referring to an interview back then in 2015 where Deputy President William Ruto mentioned he was roughly estimated to be worth 100 million Kenya shillings. And according to Tuju, in a short period of time, He's been able to acquire vast amounts of wealth, including choppers and the likes. So he was perhaps taking a sarcastic approach right there. But it seems all this is playing out in the national um, discourse. So we'll definitely try and delve deeper into this, whether these calls are warranted, even as the deputy president's camp decided to remain mute after this particular narrative was peddled by the Jubilee Party. And it's all to do with the 2022 strategy as well. Uh, Governor Anwai Guru right there exploring her options, whether it's the Jubilee Party going into 2022 or UDA. This after she made comments that uh, she accused the government of intimidation through arrests and summons by state agencies, just like the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. More details on page eight of the standard right there. But let's cross over to the Daily Nation. This is what you can expect on the front page. Uhuru's allies take on Ruto over reaches. It seems to be a similar story. No sharp contrast between these two dailies. It's all to do with the politics of the day. And according to the Daily Nation, there are plans to freeze the deputy president's bank accounts and send him tax demand letters. So it seems the onslaught against the deputy president is going up a notch higher as President Kenyatta's Jubilee Party reveals plans to send state agencies to investigate the sources of the deputy president's wealth, even as ruling Jubilee Party honchos plot to oust him as deputy party leader. The reign seems to be ongoing and we'll definitely continue monitoring the state of affairs within the ruling Jubilee Party, even as UDA is closely monitored as well. But that's the major story on the front page of the Daily Nation, even as they highlight the security situation in Laikipia County, even as the government sort of imposed a dusk to dawn curfew, even ordering a security operation in that particular area where various Kenyans have been affected due to the insecurity levels in that particular region. We'll have a story that highlights the unfortunate turn of events in terms of security matters in Laikipia Nature Conservancy, that particular area. But that's the latest in terms of what you can expect on the front pages of the Daily Nation and the Standard will definitely keep you updated. But on a similar note, let's start with the insecurity challenges in the country. And just recently, the government has slapped a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew in Laikipia Nature Conservancy in a bid to contain the growing insecurity in the area. The government has further deployed security teams to the area to weed out criminals operating in the vast conservancy. The move came on a day one more person was killed and another injured during a night attack in Mir Miriguit village, rather, bringing the total number of people killed to 13 in the past one month. Ibrahim Karanja has a story. The light of day Monday counted as the only hope for residents of Olmoran and Miriguit villages in Laikipia they hurriedly left what they have called home for years following a night of terror. Men, women and children in distress, oblivious of their destination but sure of one thing, that they will not look back. 
This was after armed gunmen rained terror on their silent villages Sunday night, killing one person and injuring another. At the homes where the criminals raided, the feel, smell and sight of death has left permanent wounds in the memories of victims. Nikasikia watu tayari wameingia kwa boma. Wakapiga risasi za kwanza kuelekesha nyumba kubwa. Alafu baadaye nikasikia wengine sababu hawa watu walikuwa wengi. Nikasikia wengine wameenda ile nyumba kidogo ya kijana. Wakati walifika hapo nikasikia sasa inapigwa na mawe. Wanapiga tu na mawe. Sasa hivi walikuwa wanapiga mabuduki. Hiyo majagiri walikuwa wanawaambia msa yangu. Watamua kama hao hiyo wameua mtu mwingine. The attack has brought to 13 the number of lives lost in the Laikipia unrests in the past one month alone. As we talk now, hundreds of cattle are grazing on those maize. And nothing is happening. Wanasema kuna vijana waliuwa askari, waliwakuta askari huko kwa station yao wakawaua. Sasa hao vijana walisikua huko kwa soko. Sasa wanasema wapatiwa hao vijana ama watumalise sisi wote. The attackers, according to witnesses, were on a revenge mission following the arrest of some herders. The herders had previously set ablaze several houses in Kisindogo area, making away with over 300 heads of cattle. Sisi ni kisasi tunalipisha. Na tutaendelea miezi miwiri. Baka tulipishe ile watu yetu wameuliwa. And following the persistent attacks, the government has declared the conservancy as a disturbed zone, paving way for a major security operation. The statement by Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi also imposed with immediate effect a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew in the area as security agencies flush out all illegal occupants of the conservancy. Further, all politicians, businessmen, public officers and other persons who have illegally moved their livestock into the conflict zone have only 48 hours to remove them. Haya ni maneno ya napangwa na serikali wanajua wenyewe mpaka sasa kwa nini bado wajakabiliana na wenye hii maneno ndio sisi inatusumbua kama serikali imekuwa ni kukula na kulala na wakora na wananchi wanaendelea kukufa kila siku na mali ya maelfu ya pesa kuharibiwa but even as the government issues directives it is a commitment to ultimately end the menace that locals are looking forward to so that's the latest from Laikipia County, even as the National Security Council actually imposed that particular task to don curfew. More details in today's dailies, even as the state continues talking tough in terms of the deteriorating security situation in the country that is rocked by banditry and farm invasions. We'll get to discuss about that later on, but let's highlight the latest in terms of the health sector in the country, where more than 5 million vaccines have been donated to Kenya from different countries as a means of boosting relations and fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. The second consignment of Moderna vaccines from the US government arrived in the country earlier yesterday with the Ministry of Health raising concerns of the Kenyans who took their first job but have failed to show up for the second shot. In a span of six months, a variety of vaccines for COVID-19 have been made available in Kenya, despite the global supply challenges. As at now, three vaccines have been approved for use in Kenya, Moderna, Oxford, AstraZeneca and Johnson and & Johnson with a second batch of 880,320 Moderna vaccine doses being the latest shipment. This shipment contains the second consignment of 880,000 Moderna doses bringing the total donation to 1.76 million Moderna vaccine doses. As of today, 2,050,377 Kenyans have received their first dose and 812,151 Kenyans are now fully vaccinated. Despite having all these vaccines available, a fraction of Kenyans who took the first job are yet to get the second shot, even after completing the required 8 to 12 weeks. What we have picked is that some people have been waiting, imagining they will mix with another vaccine. We are telling them 
that is not yet policy here in Kenya. We have now enough doses of AstraZeneca, so let them come. A week ago, 55,000 vaccines from Latvia arrived in the country, raising the total number of vaccines available for Kenyans to close to 5 million. More than 2.8 million Kenyans have taken the first dose of vaccine, and more than 800,000 are fully vaccinated, this representing close to 3% of adults' population fully vaccinated. As Delta virus continues to shake countries, more COVID-19 cases are still being recorded in Kenya, at about 8% positivity rate. Kenya's death toll so far is at more than 4,786. Saada Hassan, KTN News. Well, stay safe. If you can get the vaccine, make sure you do, since COVID-19 is still with us. On a positive note now, days after embarking on a walking mission, a former chief from Baringo County finally arrived in Nairobi, where he seeks to have a construction of the Cabernet Stadium completed. The 61-year-old Joseph Chebi Malatit is in the capital city, Nairobi, after walking more than 350 kilometers, a journey he began on August 26th. Mze Chebi from Salawa area in Baringo County hopes to meet President Uhuru Kenyatta to request him to complete the project. Has covered over 350 kilometers with only one aim to meet President Uhuru Kenyatta and request him to aid in the completion of Cabernet Stadium in the county of Baringo. On Monday morning, he met Safaricom officials to see if the corporate could assist in his mission. Although he doesn't have an official appointment to meet President Uhuru Kenyatta, Malatit is executing confidence that he will meet the head of state. Salawa <laughs> Nairobi. It is a big challenge to us youth and the entire nation. Ikiwa huyu mse kwa hiyo umri yake anaweza tembea kilomita 400 ila hali tuko na serikali tuko na professionals then ni maajabu sana. Construction of the stadium stalled several years ago. Elvis Kosgei, KT News. Well, we surely hope he gets that dream. Um, well, it might be a challenge, but we hope he gets it. Anyway, let's cross over to Education Matters right now, where the Cabinet Secretary, Professor George Magoha, has called for the implementation of a regulatory agency to regulate technical training institutions and courses. The Cabinet Secretary says diaspora remittances mostly come from menial jobs abroad that mostly youth in the country dislike. The cabinet secretary noted that most of the TVETs are already outperforming some universities in the country. He also called for TVET principles to be straightforward and ensure their institutions performed well. He was speaking in Mombasa during the Kenya Association of Technical Training Institutions retreat sponsored by the Standard Group and other stakeholders. Where did we go wrong as a country, not you? as a country where anything associated with the technical training is associated with fools or people who are not intelligent. And you are also to blame as trainers. Because you have not come out to fight and say, well, technical training is actually number one. Even you in your house keep saying, did you qualify to go to university? Which university? Where in Mjinga? Did you qualify to go to a higher training institution, which also includes 
the technical training institutes that you had. And I mentioned five of you, which means all of you can do better. Question is, are we getting value for our money? Ask yourself. Because I'm not going to repeat what has been said. The government is spending billions of shillings. Well, away from education matters now, former nominated Senator Paul Njoroge has moved to court under a certificate of urgency, seeking a declaration that the decision by IABC to hold and conduct the presidential election on the 9th of August 2022 is illegal, irregular and null and void, and that it violates constitutional rights of President Uhuru Kenyatta and Deputy President William Ruto. Now, Njoroge also wants the court to quash all tendering processes and procurements of hardware and software materials by IEBC in respect to the intended to be deployed in the presidential elections of 9th of August 2022 and a permanent order prohibiting Treasury and the control of budget from releasing and submitting any public money to IEBC for purposes of conducting the election. IEBC walienda kugazeti ile siku ya uchaguzi tarehe 9 2022 wakiwa hawana kura. Kwa hivyo kisheria hawaruhusiwi na sheria kuwa wakitangaza mwaka mmoja mbele. Na ujue hata wale makomishona ambao wameingia hata saa hii wakitaka kutangaza huo uchaguzi hawawezi kwa sababu wamepitwa na wakati. Uchaguzi wa 2022 already umepitwa na wakati kwa sababu sheria inasema unatakuwa kutangazwa uh, Kenya gazeti inatakuwa kutolewa mwaka mmoja mbele ya uchaguzi. Kwa hivyo deadline ilikuwa tarehe 9 mwezi wa nane na already hatukuwa na makomishona, hatukuwa na quorum. All right, more details on that particular petition um, in today's dailies. We'll get to discuss it in totality. But away from that to the uh, precincts of the courts right now, four suspects of money laundering have been arraigned at the JKIA law court to answer to charges of making fake currencies. Among the suspects was a Ugandan national, Abdulaziz Hassan, and a caretaker of Midea Gardens in Kileleshwa, Ethan Murevi. The suspects pleaded not guilty to the charges. Siraju Rahman Abdullahi with the details. The suspects Abdulaziz Ibrahim Hassan, Dorcas Sangila, Arum Busembi and Ethan Murevi appeared before Chief Magistrate Lucas Zoyina to answer to money laundering and forgery charges. The accused persons pleaded not guilty to 11 charges preferred against them, including having fake currencies. Some equipments used for making fake currencies were also seized during the arrest on Thursday last week. I also wish to make an application for... The suspect's lawyers prayed to the court to grant their clients favorable bond terms on the ground that, that they have cooperated with investigators. However, the prosecution opposed the application, saying that the activities they were involved in were risky. The first accused person, Your Honor, is a foreigner. During the time of his arrest, he had no documentation to show his nationality. And upon being questioned, he indicated that he was a Sudanese. The court ordered the suspects to remain in police custody until Wednesday, when it will come up for mention. And the mention confirmed filing of the same on 8th of September at 9 a.m. virtually. It's still in the corridors of justice. 33-year-old woman arrested on Sunday over fraudulent sales of hired motor vehicles and forgery has been released on 500,000 cash bill. Eunice Lewa Kimondo, Alliance Agnes Muthewa, resident of Kahawasukari, was arrested in Gatundo, Kiambu County, where she was to sell a Toyota Wish motor vehicle believed to have been hired from Nakuru County. Mudeo was arraigned in Kiambu local to where she was charged with obtaining money by false pretense. The matter will come up for mention on 17th of this month. Siraj Rahman Abdullahi, KTN News. 
All right, so that's a wrap up of some of the major stories that made headlines as we got to the new day today. And we'll get to interact with our panelists right here in studio to perhaps shed more light on this various news making headlines. As I mentioned earlier, the papers today have covered some of those issues extensively. And we'd also like to interact with you back at home as well. So feel free to call in. The number will be um, shown on the screen in a few right now where we'll get to interact with you, not just via calling, but also via social media. Remember, at KTN News KE is a Twitter page we will be interacting on. We're joined in studio already by Professor Alfred Omenia, who's a governance analyst 